my name is Barbara Saradick, and I'm an R&D scientist with Life Technologies. I'll be speaking with you today about the use of flow cytometry in microbiological research. I have the pleasure of working out of our Eugene, Oregon site, birthplace of the molecular probes labeling and de detection technology. This is our fifth webinar focused on flow cytometry. If you are interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit the Flow Cytometry Resource Center on our website for some great tutorial tutorials and to listen to our earlier webinars if you have not done so already. Our next webinar is scheduled for May 17, 2012. This webinar will be presented by my colleague, Jolene Bradford, and the topic will be stem cell side population analysis using flow cytometry. This time, I will also mention to please submit questions during the presentation. I'll try to answer as many questions, questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. It's likely that I'll answer some of the questions after the webinar has been. Because we have a diverse audience listening today, I will begin with covering some basic information about both microbiology and flow cytometry. From there, we will spend some time discussing small particle analysis, intrinsic fluorescence, and I'll finish by providing some information about common reagents used for bacterial and yeast analysis. I hope by the end of this presentation, you are as excited about the possibilities of flow cytometry in the field of microbiology as I am. Let's start with microbiology 001, basics for non-microbiologists. Note that this isn't Micro 100, and I will be giving the briefest of introduction about microbiology for those of you who spend most of your time thinking about eukaryotic cells. So, what is microbiology? If we look up the word microbiology in the dictionary, the definition we will find is a branch of biology dealing with microscopic forms of life. Some of those microscopic forms of life may be yeast, such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, belonging to the eukaryote domain, or Vibrio cholera, belonging to the bacteria domain of life. In fact, we can find microscopic forms in all three domains of the phylogenetic tree. Most of us don't consider the microbes that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Bacteria are truly everywhere. You may not know it, but your body is covered in bacteria. There is a conservative estimate there are 10 times more bacterial cells associated with the human body and eukaryotic cells in the human body itself. For example, there are thousands of bacteria in the human gut that have important implications in human health, such as the role in mucosal immunity and protection of the host from colonization by harmful alien microbes. Microbes are also intimately associated with the food we eat. It is likely that when you ate today, that you may have ingested something that bacteria had a role in producing. In fact, most healthy crops grown in the field are colonized by communities of endophytic bacteria that increase plant growth by providing fixed nitrogen to non-legume plants and increasing micronutrient utilization from the soil. Other bacteria, such as species of Prochlorococcus, play important roles in global, global carbon cycle, while other bacteria are capable of metabolizing environmental pollutants and are used in bioremediation. There are even bacteria that have been isolated from honeybee guts that are found to be beneficial to honeybee colonies. Unfortunately, when most people hear or think about bacteria, what is thought of are harmful microbes. This is really unfortunate because of the thousands of bacterial species that exist, only a few are harmful. Harmful microbes could be bacteria that cause infection and disease in humans such as methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or commonly known as MRSA, which can cause skin infections not readily treated by some antibiotics. Another example is Salmonella typhimurium, which causes gastroenteritis in humans. Harmful microbes can also be organisms that cause disease in plants, such as the organism Xanthomonas campestris, which causes bacterial spot and destruction of tomato crops. Harmful microbes can also be organisms used in bioterrorism, such as Bacillus and Thrace, the producer of the anthrax toxin. Note that I am not referring to anthrax, the ban. Bit of humor for the microbiologists in the audience. I hope 
but it's abundantly clear to all the non-microbiologists in the audience that microbes are important industrially, environmentally, and medically. But what do microbiologists study? We've already touched on a few. Microbiologists may study medical microbiology or host-mediated or host-microbial interactions, such as how normal gut flora impacts human health or how our cells interact with invading pathogens. Microbiologists could also study environmental microbiology and investigate what bacteria are found in a particular environment and what, role, what the role of these bacteria are. Other microbiologists may examine how microbes may be implicated in an, may be applied in an industrial application. In fact, there are many bacterial products that are found in commercial products today, such as detergents. Lastly, some microbiologists may study molecular biology and use bacteria as model systems to study cellular processes, such as gene regulation or cell cycle control, to name just two. This brief introduction uh, to microbiology leads us to our first polling question, which unfortunately I've advanced the slide on and you can see the answer. <laughs> Under nor normal circumstances, I would have given you um, an opportunity to answer this question, which was this, true or false? If you wash your hands a lot during the day and you are not likely to encounter, you are not likely to encounter bacteria. The answer to this question is false. With very vigorous hand washing, you could wash most of the bacteria off your hands, but there'd still be many, many bacteria associated with other parts of your body, even in bizarre places such as earwax. Now that we've covered a bit of basic microbiology, I'd like to cover some introductory information for the non-flow cytometrists in the audience. Again, I encourage you to listen to our earlier webinars for more in-depth information about flow cytometry if you're interested in learning more. So, what is flow cytometry? Or rather, what do those dots mean? Cytometry is the measurement of physical or chemical characteristics, cells, or particles. Flow cytometry are measurements that are made as cells or particles in suspension pass individually through an instrument called a flow cytometer. In other words, flow cytometry is a technology that simultaneously measures and then analyzes multiple physical characteristics of single particles, which are usually cells, as they flow in a fluid stream through a beam of light. The instrument that makes these measurements is called a flow cytometer. Flow cytometers come in different shapes, sizes, and may differ in the technology used in particle focusing. I've included an image here of one type of cytometer, an acoustic focusing cytometer called the Attune. The Attune and most flow cytometers on the market consist of three systems a fluidic system to introduce cells for interrogation by the laser, an optic system to collect light signals, and an electronic system to convert the optical signal to proportional electronic signals for computer analysis. Together, these three systems permit measurements to be made on suspensions of single cells and provide discrete measurements from each cell or particle in the suspension. Because many, many particles or cells are analyzed, it provides a distribution of the measured characteristics. Within the flow cytometer, cells or particles in the sample are delivered by the fluidic system to the flow cell. Inside the flow cell, the particles pass single file through a laser beam where they scatter light and emit fluorescence that is filtered, selected, and converted into digital values prior to storage on a computer file. Forward scatter is the light that is scattered in the forward direction as laser light strikes the cell. The magnitude of forward scatter is roughly proportional to the size of the cell or particle. Side scatter is defined as the light that is scattered at larger angles. Side scatter is indicative of the granularity and structural complexity inside the cell or particle. 
Light scattered light is focused through a lens system and collected by a separate detector, usually located 90 degrees from the laser path. In this simple optics layout for a single laser flow cytometer, we can follow the path of laser light through its source to final destination. Laser light is directed through the flow cell in which it interrogates and interacts with particles or cells in the sample. The light that is scattered from the sample is directed and filtered through a series of mirrors and filters, the part of the instrument that will detect the light scatter and fluorescence. This part of the instrument is called a photodetector, or in the instance of or in the instance of fluorescence detection, photomultiplier tube. Within the photodetector, the light signal is amplified and converted to an electronic signal. You will notice in this example that the system contains four photodetectors. Some flow cytometers are equi equipped with multiple lasers which permit detection of fluorescent labels excited by different wavelengths of light. In these multi-laser cytometers, each particle passes through each laser interrogation point at different times. Instruments with multiple laser light sources will also have additional photodetectors to detect fluorescent emission from the additional laser light sources. For example, there are some flow cytometers which have five different lasers and 20 different photodetectors. The presence of multiple photodetectors permits the collection of multiple fluorescent signals from the same sample. In other words, the user can label their sample of interest with multiple fluorescent reagents and then analyze the sample to obtain information about multiple parameters at the same time. For example, a user could simultaneously investigate DFP fluorescence in a population of bacterial cells, while at the same time investigate fluorescence of a dead cell indicator, such as propidium iodide. On the right-hand side of the slide, there are the results of such an experiment. The single parameter histogram plots provide information such as what percentage of cells are positive for the fluorescent signal of interest, and how bright that signal is. In this case, our histogram plots give us information about GFP and propidium iodide fluorescence. The dual parameter plot provides information about the percentage of cells labeled with neither fluorescent marker, both fluorescent markers together for each fluorescent marker individually. As you can imagine, the complexity of an experiment increases the number of fluorescent labels used in the experiment. But how does all this flow cytometry relate to microbiology? As it turns out, microbiologists have been using flow cytometry as a tool for quite some time. Flow cytometry has been used in microbial detection, for study of host-microbe interaction, for susceptibility testing, for study of microbial activity and metabolism, and extensively in the study of oceanography. As you may remember, all these areas that flow cytometry has been applied to represent some of the major areas of study conducted by microbiologists. Host microbe interaction, industrial microbiology, environmental microbiology, and medical microbiology. We know that microbiologists are using flow cytometry because flow cytometry assays are fast. Flow cytometry assays process thousands of events for cells per second. Flow Secondly, Flow cytometry assays yield statistically significant results. And thirdly, flow cytometry assays permit multi-parametric measurements, such as the simultaneous analysis of DNA content or cell cycle with measurements of antigen expression or analysis of enzymatic characteristics. From this, the researcher truly obtains a multidimensional representation of individual cells within the population. A good question is, why aren't all microbiologists using flow cytometry? There may be several reasons. One may be cost or instrument availability. Historically, flow cytometers have been too expensive for many labs to purchase. However, in recent years, costs have decreased. Another reason may be due to lack of physical space. 
Flow cytometers can be large instruments, taking up several square feet in footprint. Recent changes in the design of many flow cytometers has decreased the footprint, and some are even small enough now to fit in a biological safety cabinet. Other reasons that more microbiologists may not be using flow cytometry may be reagent selection and the challenge of small particle analysis. I will speak more on these speak more on both these points later in the webinar. However, you may see from the dual parameter plot shown on this slide that discrimination of a bacterial population, shown in green, from another population, which is noise, shown in black, can be difficult. However, there are ways of making bacterial identification easier, such as inclusion of a fluorescent stain, such as Cyto9, in your assay. Using a fluorescent stain leads to easy differentiation of the population of cells of interest which stain positive for the fluorescent dye used. This leads us to our second polling question. The question is, true or false? Most microbiological research is conducted on bacteria that cause disease. I will give you 20 to 30 seconds to submit your answer to this question. Again, I repeat, the question is true or false? Most microbiological research is conducted on bacteria that cause disease. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Looks like 83% of our audience has answered the question correctly. The answer is false. Some microbiological research is conducted on bacteria that cause disease but there is also a great deal of research conducted on bacteria that do not cause disease. Let's move to our next to topic, small particle analysis. What exactly is a small particle? Small particle is a term used in flow cytometry that can describe submicron particles such as bacteria, yeast, synthetic microspheres, or cell-derived microparticles. I've included here images of each of these examples on the slide, but what you can't appreciate from these images is how small each is relative to a larger cell. For many decades, flow cytometry has been used to study eukaryotic cells, especially blood cells, such as the blastocyst, monocyte, neutrophil, or lymphocyte cells shown in this diagram. As you can see, Phytoplankton and bacteria are much, much smaller than these types of cells. The small size of bacteria presents different considerations for a flow cytometry experiment. It is important to recognize and appreciate these differences. One of my favorite expressions concerning analysis of microbes in flow cytometry comes from Howard Shapiro in his book, Practical Flow Cytometry. In it, he states, the most important fact about microbial cytometry is this. Bacteria are not just little eukaryotes. Not only are bacteria much, much smaller than eukaryotes, they also have some distinct morphological and genetic differences. If we revisit our phylogenetic tree of life, we can compare the three domains and see some major differences. Bacteria have no nuclear envelope, whereas eukary eukaryotes and archaea do. Bacteria have pitoglycan within their cell wall, while others do not. Bacteria have only one kind of RNA polymerase, and their DNA does not contain introns. In comparison, archaea and eukaryotes have several kinds of RNA polymerase, and introns are present in both to some degree. Even within the bacteria domain alone, there is great variation. For example, bacteria can be grouped into two large categories based on differences in their cell wall characteristics. Because of the differences between bacteria and other types of cells more commonly examined in flow cytometry, a flow cytometry user needs to ensure that proper consideration is made to their study. Are the reagents used and the strategy employed suitable for a flow cytometry assay of bacteria? Or is the researcher trying to use the same methods used in the, in the analysis of larger eukaryotic cells? 
The most obvious and prominent difference in a flow cytometry-based assay of bacteria is the difference in light scatter by bacteria as compared to eukaryotic cells. On the left-hand side of this slide, I've been shown an example of whole lysed human blood. The cells in this sample typically range in size from 5 to 10 microns in diameter. If we were to analyze bacteria, which typically are less than 1 micron in diameter, the same way we are used to analyzing eukaryotic cells, we would end up with the results shown in the top right-hand side of the slide. Almost no results. As you can see, there are some green dots in the bottom left of this dual parameter plot close to where the x and y axes intersect. If we change the scale of the axes in both these examples from a linear display to a logarithmic display, we can see important differences. As viewed in logarithmic scale, the populations of larger blood cells are squished together because they all fall within one log side scatter versus forward scatter plot. In comparison, the much smaller bacteria cells are, is, are visible when viewed in log scale. This is because the small size of bacteria necessitates viewing of a dual parameter scatter plot in logarithmic scale. Otherwise, our population of interest will get buried in the corner. The keys to a successful microbiological experiment using flow cytometry can be summarized in two points correct instrument setup, and good sample preparation. I will speak more on both of these in the next slides, but a great resource for more information on both outside the scope of this webinar can be found in the book, Practical Flow Cytometry, by Howard Shapiro. In order to speak of instrument setup, we need to revisit what actually happens within a flow cytometer when a particle is interrogated by a beam of light. Recall that light signals are generated as particles pass through a laser beam, and that these light signals are converted to electronic signals, or voltage pulses, by photodetectors. When a cell or particle passes through a focused laser beam, it scatters light in all directions and can emit fluorescence. The scatter and the fluorescence last only a few microseconds, but because the cells or particles are moving very rapidly through a focus, because the uh, cells or particles are moving rapidly through the focused laser beam. The detectors convert the momentary flash of light into an electrical signal called a voltage pulse. When the cell begins to enter the laser beam, signal intensity is low because only a small portion of the particle scatters light. The voltage pulse reaches its maximum when the cell is in the middle of the laser beam and the whole particle scatters the light. As the cell or particle exits the beam, the signal starts decreasing and the voltage pulse eventually tra trails off below the threshold. If the pulse from this event exceeds the user-specified threshold value, the data generated from this event is further processed to simultaneously calculate pulse height, pulse area, and pulse width. You may be wondering what the threshold is for a voltage pulse. Threshold is the defined amplitude above which is used to indicate the presence of an event. Threshold is a user-defined parameter. In other words, the flow cytometry operator defines a parameter, whether it be a scatter parameter, such as forward or side scatter, or a fluorescent parameter, such as GFP for fluorescence, for example, and sets a minimum value associated with that parameter to represent the minimum voltage pulse above that must be created by a particle for the signal to be considered a true event. On this slide, we can see two examples of voltage pulse. On the left is an example of a voltage pulse with amplitude above the threshold, indicating the pulse corresponds to a real event. On the right of the slide is an example in which the amplitude of voltage pulse falls below the threshold. An event is not recorded in this case. For microbial analysis, threshold is a significant parameter because bacteria are so small they can have forward and side scatter characteristics similar to the noise of a system. If instrument threshold and other settings are set incorrectly, the bacterial population may be misidentified. Before we talk about what noise is, let's take a closer look at how threshold affects our results using our GFP expressing bacteria example. Shown on this slide are the results from analysis of GFP-expressing bacteria using different thresholds. 
either a forward scatter or side scatter threshold alone, both forward and scatter threshold together, or results from using a fluorescent threshold alone. The, sample was the same sample was analyzed in each example. The only difference was that the results were obtained using different threshold instrument settings. The top panel contains side scatter versus forward scatter dot plots, which demonstrate differences in how the forward and side scatter data will visually appear when using different threshold methods. In each scatter plot, the bacterial population is colored either red or green. The center panel contains histograms of GFP fluorescence found within the colored population identified from the scatter plot, and the last panel quantifies the percentage of GFP positive cells in that population. The first thing to take note of in this example is that the colored population, or bacterial population, looks similar in each scatter plot, but the events outside the colored population look different, depending on which that threshold is used. For example, the far left plot displays uh, results from analysis when a forward scatter threshold is used alone. In this plot, the black noise population appears cut off. This is because the sample was analyzed using an operator-defined threshold value set to 2,000 forward scatter units. Consequently, if the measured, for measured forward scatter value fell below 2,000 forward scatter units, the event was not considered a real event. The scatter plot, which looks distinctly different from the rest, is the last scatter plot, found at the far right of the top panel. This scatter plot displays results from analysis in which a fluorescent threshold was used. In this case, only one population is observed because in this example, the user-defined threshold was set to 10,000 fluorescence units. You may also note that the histograms displaying GFP fluorescence and the values of percent GFP positive cells is almost exactly the same for the three scatter thresholding methods, but is different when a fluorescence threshold was used. In this case, the histogram and percent GFP positive cells is different because the instrument was set to essentially ignore events falling below a set value of GFP fluorescence. So the entire population identified in the scatter plot is GFP positive. Now, to get back to the issue of noise, what exactly is it and why do we see it? Noise is present in all flow cytometry experiments and can be described as signals with minimal voltage pulse. These signals with minimal voltage pulse can result from stray light interacting with the, with the sensitive photo detectors within the instrument or may be the result of noise from the electronic components of the flow cytometer itself. The word noise can also be uh, used to describe debris or particulates within a sample. We may see noise as the result of a refractive index mismatch between the sample and the buffer or sheath used in the flow cytometer. Ideally, the flow cytometry operator will adjust the threshold settings so that the noise population is ignored from analysis and that the only events observed are actual events. A good example of this is found on the previous slide when a fluorescence threshold was used. It was very clear in that example which was the bacterial population. There are several tips and tricks we can employ to minimize noise and aid in the correct population identification in a microbial analysis using flow cytometry. The first is to use a fluorescent marker. Incorporation of a fluorescent label in your sample, whether it be a genetically encoded marker, a fluorescent stain, or a fluorescently labeled antibody, will enable the user to identify the bacterial population from instrument noise more easily. The second tip is to understand the fluorescence marker used. Does the fluorescent marker stain the organism you're interested in studying? Do you have the appropriate controls in the experiment? Thirdly, take care to reduce noise. Filter the buffers used in sample preparation and staining through a 0.2 micron filter. In addition, use sample buffers with similar refractive index as the instrument sheath. For example, if your sheath buffer used in the instrument is 1 times TBS, use 1 times TBS to stain your samples. Lastly, take care to avoid sample aggregation. Use your sample at appropriate concentration. For a typical flow cytometer, an appropriate cell concentration is approximately 5 times 10 to the 5 to 1 times 10 to the 7 cells per mil. 
if you do suspect sample aggregation, employ doublet discrimination. Taken together, we can generate a good strategy for small particle analysis. I'll summarize this in context using the example of analysis of GSP expressing bacteria. The bacteria were grown and then washed in 0.2 micron filtered buffer of similar refractive index as our instrument chief buffer. During instrument setup, appropriate plots were made so that the bacteria could be visualized in logarithmic scale. Threshold was set to exclude noise from the measurement, although in this example some noise is shown for demonstration purposes. Samples were analyzed at approximately 1 times 10 to the 6 cells per mil, and the data was investigated for a coincident event. Once aggregates were removed from analysis, a histogram of GFP fluorescence was generated. In this histogram, we observed both GFP positive and GFP negative cells. The gating strategy used to obtain the final results was confirmed by checking the population hierarchy. This leads us to our third polling question, which is a multiple choice question. The question is, Analyzing small particles using flow cytometry requires different setup than typical eukaryotic cell analysis because A, they don't require different setup, B, they may scatter light similarly to instrument noise, C, they contaminate your flow cytometer, or D, both B and C. I will give you 20 to 30 seconds to submit your answer. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. As it turns out, it looks like forty three percent of the audience has uh, identified B as the correct answer, which is true. Small particle analysis using flow cytometry requires different setup than the typical eukaryotic cell analysis because small particles may scatter light similarly to instrument noise. It looks like many of you thought that bacteria may contaminate your flow cytometer, and this is not a problem with normal instrument maintenance. Um, this leads us to our fourth topic in this webinar, taking advantage of intrinsic fluorescence. So what is intrinsic fluorescence and how does it differ from extrinsic fluorescence? Intrinsic fluorescence is fluorescence that is naturally occurring within an organism. For example, the jellyfish shown here on the left side of the slide, the Coria victoria, was the source of green fluorescent protein which sparked an increase in the availability of fluorescent proteins as biological markers. In contrast, extrinsic fluorescence is fluorescence due to an extrinsic factor. For example, fluorescence observed in human blood cells resulting from reaction of those cells with an antibody conjugated to a fluorescent label such as a Q. nanocrystal. Many organisms besides jellyfish have intrinsic fluorescence. In the field of microbiology, two research areas that study organisms with intrinsic fluorescence are the fields of biofuel research and oceanography. We are all familiar with the need for an alternative fuel supply, as our world's fuel needs increase and fossil fuel supply steadily decreases. As such, the race is on for discovery or generation of a new form of fuel, such as biofuel. The organisms investigated uh, that produce biofuel are actually algae, single-celled microorgan microorganisms with intrinsic fluorescence, making them perfect candidates for a flow cytometry experiment. Here's an example of a classic biofuel investigation using flow cytometry. In this study, researchers have used flow cytometry to assess marine algae for lipid content and further use cell sorting to isolate cells that were the best candidates for biodiesel development. As a first step, chlorophyll-containing photosynthetic organisms were detected. Photosynthetic organisms were then further segregated into distinct populations by comparing intrinsic fluorescence from phycoerythrin and phycocyanin molecules. The results from this comparison are shown in the dot plot on the far right. Cells within the individual clusters were analyzed for phycoerythrin content, and five distinct algal populations were observed. 
The algae samples were sorted based on phycoerythrin and phycocyanin fluorescence, and the sorted cells were analyzed for lipid content by staining with the Bodipi 505-515 lipid probe. It's very easy to visualize the lipid bodies within the algal cells using this staining method. If you're interested in other reagents for use in biofuel research besides the Bodipi lipid probe already described, I've included this table for reference taken from a recent review on application of flow cytometry to biofield research. Another area of study in which the intrinsic fluorescence of microorganisms are examined using flow cytometry is the field of oceanography. For years, oceanographers have been using flow cytometry as a tool for studying the biology, ecology, and biogeochemistry of marine photosynthetic picoplankton. These organisms are intrinsically fluorescent due to their photopigment content. Differences in the photopigment com composition can be used to distinguish the various groups. In 1988, a research group published a study in Nature describing a flow cytometric signature from abundant red fluorescing cells located deep in the oceanic euphotic zone. It was later determined that the cells identified with that particular flow cytometric signature were members of, a, of the Prochlorococcus species. Prochlorococcus and Synechococcus, shown on this slide, are the two major groups of microbes that, compromise, that comprise photosynthetic picoplankton and have been extensively studied for their role in the global carbon cycle. While both Prochlorococcus and Synechococcus are abundant in oceanic samples, Differences in their endogenous fluorescent protein composition enable discrimination amongst the two genus of bacteria. Prochlorococcus are approximately 0.6 microns in diameter and contain the red fluorescent divinyl chlorophylls A and B. The necococcus are larger, about 1 micron in diameter, and contain orange fluorescent phycoerythrin in addition to red fluorescent chlorophyll. In a flow cytometry-based study of oceanic samples containing the two types of picoplankton, one strategy that can be applied to differentiate the cells is to, an is to anal analyze fluorescence emission from endogenous fluorescent proteins using multiple fluorescent excitation sources. We can tell from the excitation curve of divinyl chlorophyll shown on this slide the 405 nanometer and 488 nanometer laser light sources are appropriate wavelengths of light for dual laser excitation of the perchlorococcus containing oceanic samples. To do this type of analysis, a multi-laser flow cytometer is needed. Shown here is the attuned acoustic focusing cytometer, which is equipped with 405 and 488 nanometer lasers in this example. Here are the results from analysis of oceanic samples from the Station Aloha Oceanographic Research Location found in the Pacific Ocean. In this experiment, samples from sea surface or deep waters were excited using both 405 and 488 nanometer excitation. The fluorescence emission of divinyl chlorophyll from excitation by these two different laser light sources is shown in the dual parameter plots on this, plot, on this slide. Analysis of both water samples indicates three populations of cells can be differentiated using this method, a prochlorococcus population, a synechococcus population, and a picoeukaryote population. Note that one micron diameter fluorescent beads were included in the analysis of sizing standard. On the left, results from analysis of surface waters indicate that while there is a large prochlorococcus population at this site, Cells in this population have low divinyl chlorophyll abundance. In contrast, samples from deep waters have populations of perchlorococcus with increased abundance of divinyl chlorophyll, as indicated by the increase in fluorescence intensity of divinyl chlorophyll using both 405 and 488 nanometer excitation. It's also worth mentioning that fluorescent stains and other reagents may be used in combination with samples that have intrinsic fluorescence. For example, inclusion of a DNA stain, such as CyberGreen-1, in environmental marine samples enables the fluorescence detection of, the to of total microbial content in a particular sample. In this example, surface and deep water samples were stained with the nucleic acid 
dye Cyber Green 1. Cyber Green 1 will label all of DNA containing particles within the sample. When analyzed using this method, only the perchlorococcus population is distinct from other particles in the sample. This is because while all DNA containing organisms will stain positive for Cyber Green 1, only the perchlorococcus will stain positive for Cyber Green 1 and divinyl chlorophyll. Also to note, again, is that we see differences in samples analyzed from surface and deep waters. Samples from surface waters have low divinyl chlorophyll abundance, whereas samples from deep waters have increased divinyl chlorophyll abundance. This leads us to our fourth polling question. True or false? Odipi and Nile Red are two fluorescent dyes shown to stain lipids and are useful in biofuel research. I will repeat the question again. True or false? Odipi and Nile Red are two fluorescent dyes shown to stain lipids and are useful in biofuel research. I'll give you 20 to 30 seconds to submit your answer. Looks like we have some results coming in. I'll give you 10 more seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Looks like most of you answered um, this question correctly. The answer is true. Both Bodipi and Nile Red can be used as lipids and are useful in biofuel research. Now I'd like to spend some time discussing common reagents used for bacterial and yeast analysis. There are many reagents for use in a microbiological study using flow cytometry, some of which are listed here and sold by Life Technologies. Products are available for simple bacterial cell staining, products for investigation of bacterial viability, bacterial cell counting, determination of bacterial gram character, and products to study microbial metabolism. In the next few slides, I will briefly review some of these products and how they can be applied to your microbial research. The first product I will highlight are the backlight red and backlight green bacterial stains. These reagents are non-nucleic acid binding fluorescent stains that have high affinity for the bacterial cell wall. These reagents can be used in fixed and live samples and can see both gram-positive and gram-negative cells. The backlight reagents come in two colors, backlight green, excited by the 488 nanometer blue laser emitting at 516 nanometers, and backlight red, excited by the 635 nanometer or red laser and emitting at 644 nanometers. Shown here are two histogram plots of bacterial stain cells stained with the backlight green reagent and analyzed on the Attune Acoustic Focusing Cytometer. The histogram on the left indicates results from a sample of gram-negative bacteria, while the histogram on the right displays results from a sample of gram-positive bacteria. As you can see, for both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, application of the backlight green bacterial stain increases fluorescence in both live and fixed cells over the fluorescence observed in the unstained sample. The backlight reagents have also been used in numerous studies to detect microbes. A couple of the studies are listed on this slide. Another useful product is the Live Backlight Bacterial Gram Stain Kit. This provides a novel one-step fluorescence assay for the determination of gram character in living bacteria. This product has advantages over the classic gram stain procedure in that samples do not require fixation and the assay can be completed in less time than is required for a typical gram stain. The kit is composed of two dyes, Cyto9 and Hexidium iodide. While Cyto9 stains both gram positive and gram negative bacteria, Hexidium iodide only stains gram positive cells. When gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria are simultaneously stained in a mixed population with both sides, gram-negative bacteria will fluoresce green, while gram-positive bacteria will fluoresce red. The dual-parameter plot shown on the right-hand side of the slide indicates results of an experiment in which a mix of gram-negative E. coli and gram-positive bacillus subtilis 
are mixed and stained with the live backlight bacterial gram stain kit and analyzed on the Attune Acoustic Focusing Cytometer. Two distinct bacterial cell populations are evident, one corresponding to the hexidium iodide positive bacillus population and the other the hexidium iodide negative E. coli population. Another great product is the Live Dead Backlight Bacterial Viability Kit. This kit enables researchers to identify bacteria and quantitate both live and dead bacteria in a shorter period of time than using classic microbiological methods. In classic microbiology, a researcher would need to dilute, plate, and grow bacteria for 24 hours before a viable cell count could be determined. In comparison, similar results can be obtained in less time with less effort using a flow cytometry-based assay. Using this method, the researcher simply adds fluorescent stains to their sample, waits 15 minutes, and then is able to analyze the sample by flow cytometry and obtain results. The live dead kit contains two dyes, rapidium iodide and cyto-9. While cyto-9 stains both live and dead cells, Terpidium iodide only stains cells with dead cells within the sample. Using this combination of dyes, the ratio of live to dead cells can be determined in addition to quantification of cell number. Cell number can either be directly measured if the stained cells are analyzed on a syringe-driven flow cytometer or by inclusion of counting beads in the experiment if a pressure-driven system exists. This is different from classical plate count methods, which don't permit quantification of dead cells within a culture. The live dead kit can be used with both, both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, and for both cell types, the similar, similar cell counts have been determined using this flow cytometry method as compared to the traditional plate count method. Another application of flow cytometry to the study of microbiology is investigation of bacterial cell membrane potential. One reagent sold by Life Technologies is the Backlight Membrane Potential Kit. This kit measures changes in membrane permeability that can occur in response to changes in uh, membrane permeability, antibiotic treatment, or cell death, to name a few. The kit is composed of the fluorescent dye 3-3-prime diethyl carbo cyanine iodide, or DIAC2. At low concentrations, the dye exhibits green fluorescence in all bacterial cells, but it becomes more concentrated in healthy cells that are maintaining uh, correct membrane potential, causing the dye to self-associate and the fluorescence emission to shift red. The red and green fluorescent bacterial populations are easily distinguished using a flow cytometer. In the dual parameter plot shown on the right of the slide, we see a bacterial sample stained with DIAC2, treated with the proton ionophore, CCCP. In a healthy culture, which is not treated with CCCP, the cells have red shifted fluorescence. In the sample treated with CCCP, which eradicates the proton gradient similar to um, gradient to eliminate bacterial membrane potential, the fluorescence is not shifted red and remains more green. This reagent has been used in numerous studies, a few of which are indicated on this slide. Another great product for the study of bacterial vitality is the Backlight Redox Sensor Green Vitality Kit. This reagent is an indicator of bacterial reductase activity. This reductase activity, in, in turn, is a reliable marker for changes in electron transport chain function and for changes in vitality. Redox sensor green penetrates both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Following reduction, the redox sensor green reagent will produce a stable green fluorescent signal in as little as 10 minutes. Shown in the histogram on the right of this slide is a sample of bacteria stained with the redox sensor green reagent. In untreated cells, shown in green, the reagent produces a bright fluorescent signal. In comparison, samples treated with an agent that disrupts the electron transport chain, such as sodium azide, the fluorescent signal is dramatically decreased. This reagent has been used in some very interesting studies, such as this article published in 2008. In this study, lake sediment samples were stained with redox sensor green, and the reagent was used as a fluorescent marker to sort bacteria based on a metabolic characteristic. 
There are also many products available for analysis of yeast samples using flow cytometry, including products for analysis of yeast viability, vitality, and cell cycle. However, before I discuss these products, I will briefly describe one additional bacteria-specific product which may be useful for the study of host-microbe interaction. The Frodo Red E. coli Bioparticles Phagocytosis Kit may be of interest to researchers studying medical microbiology. The kit contains ready-made Frodo Red Bioparticle Bioparticle conjugates for analysis of phagocytosis of gram-negative bacteria. The bioparticle conjugates contain a pH-sensitive rhodamine-based dye that is non-fluorescent and neutral pH that turns bright red upon acidification. Because it is both fluorogenic and pH-sensitive, it can be used as a specific sensor of phagocytic events. It is therefore an ideal tool with which to study phagocytosis and its regulation by drugs and or environmental factors. The histogram plot and dual parameter dot plot shown in this slide indicate results of such an experiment in which a sample of whole lysed human blood was incubated at either 4 degrees or 37 degrees Celsius. Phagocytosis was inhibited in a sample held at 4 degrees, whereas samples held at 37 degrees have a bright fluorescent signal corresponding to phagocytosis of the bioparticle by cells within the sample and acidification of the pH Frodo dye following phagocytosis. The first yeast specific product I will highlight is the Live Dead Fungalite Yeast Viability Kit. This kit is similar to the Live Dead Backlight Bacterial Viability Kit discussed earlier in that it enables researchers to easily reliably uh, quantitate and distinguish live and dead yeast cells in minutes using flow cytometry. The kit contains the Cyto9 green fluorescent dye and the red fluorescent nucleic acid stain Propidium iodide. These stains differ in their ability to penetrate healthy yeast cells. When used alone, the Cyto9 stain generally labels all yeast in a population, those with intact membranes and those with damaged membranes, whereas the Propidium iodide penetrates only yeast with damaged membranes. The dual parameter plot shown on the right of the slide indicate results from a sample of Saccharomyces cerevisiae stained with the live dead fungalite yeast viability kit. In this experiment, a mix of live and dead cells were mixed before staining in an analysis using the acoustic flow cytometer. The attuned acoustic flow cytometer. The live cell population is shown in green and is positive for Cyto9 fluorescence, whereas the dead cell population is shown in red and positive for both Cyto9 and Propidium iodide fluorescence. Also shown on this slide is an example of Saccharomyces cerevisiae stained with a live dead kit used in imaging applications. The last product that I'll mention is the Cytox green nucleic acid stain. This stain has been used extensively as a DNA stain in analysis of cell cycle and budding yeast. Researchers report um, that Cytox Green provides superior staining in, of DNA over other reagents because it yields better coefficients of variation, improved linearity between DNA content and fluorescence, and decreased peak drift associated with changes in dye concentration, growth, growth conditions, or cell size. An example of a Saccharomyces cerevisiae culture stained with Cytox Green and analyzed on the attuned acoustic focusing cytometer is shown in the histogram plot on the right of the slide. Two peaks of DNA content are visible, corresponding to cells in the G2 or G1 phases of cell cycle. The ratio of G2 to G1 cells is 1.96, as expected. Also shown on this slide is an example of yeast stained with cytox green visualized using fluorescent microscopy. I'd like to end this presentation with a slide dedicated to the most common queries that I encounter when speaking with researchers about the application of flow cytometry to a microbi microbiological study. The first is the concern of whether bacteria will contaminate the user's instrument. The answer is no, not if the instrument is properly utilized and maintained. The second question I often come across is, where do my bacteria show up in a scatter plot? This can be confusing if you're looking at your data in the default linear scale that is used in most uh, flow cytometry software. Before you begin your experiment, set up your workspace with the appropriate plot. Visualize, 
To visualize bacteria in a scatter plot, make sure it is in logarithmic scale. A third common question is how to count cells in an environmental sample. There are several answers to this question. The first option is to either use a live dead kit, such as the Backlight Live Dead Bacterial Viability Kit. And you can use this to obtain an accurate number of both live and dead cells within the sample. Alternatively, a DNA stain could be used as a standalone or in conjunction with intrinsic fluorescence to define the populations of interest. In either case, counting beads will need to be included in the analysis if you are using a pressure-driven system. If you are using a syringe-driven a syringe-driven instrument, you may be able to get accurate cell counts from your cytometer. Another common question is, can I differentiate bacterial species using flow cytometry? The answer is yes, only if there are differences in G plus C content between the species. An example of such an experiment is shown on the left of this slide. In this experiment, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosus, and Staphylococcus aureus were stained, stained with chromomycin A3 and Hirsch 33258 before analysis by flow cytometry. Chromomycin A3 preferably binds guanine and cytosine bases, whereas Hirsch 33258 preferably bind adenine and thymine bases. And it is because of these differences that you can differentiate species that differ in base pair composition. Lastly, a common question is what strategies can a user employ to sort bacteria from a mixed population? One idea is to try exploiting metabolic differences in the cells of the, in the sample, such as what was used in the example study using redox sensor green. Another idea is to excite your sample using multiple wavelengths of light and attempt to differentiate groups of bacteria based on endogenous fluorescence. We're almost through our presentation and we have one polling question left. The question is multiple choice. If you are researching next generation antibiotics and you want to quickly assess how effectively the candidate compounds kill E. coli, an appropriate stain for this application is A, the Backlight Live Dead Viability Kit, B, the Backlight Membrane Potential Kit, C, no stain, just rely on scatter, or both A and B. It looks like Almost everyone who's answered this question has chosen D, both A and B. That is, in fact, the correct answer. Um, you can use either the Backlight Live Dead Viability Kit or the Backlight Membrane Potential Kit to answer this question. And with that, I will end our slide. I want to thank you for your time today and leave, leave you with some additional resources if you'd like to learn more about the instruments and products mentioned in this webinar. I'd also like to direct you to our flow cytometry resource site for additional webinars and tutorials. Don't forget about our next webinar, which is scheduled for May 17, 2012. This webinar will be presented by my colleague, Jolene Bradford, and the topic will be stem cell, stem cell side population analysis using flow cytometry. Some additional resources available to you are our flow, is the Life Technologies flow cytometry mobile app. You can go you can go to your mobile device and download it directly to your phone or follow the link to learn more about this app. I'd also like you to join our Facebook pages on flow cytometry and immunology to share your questions and learnings with the community. That brings us to the end of the webinar. Please feel free to submit your questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, it looks like one question here is, can I measure particle size using flow cytometry? Um, you can get a relative measure of particle size using flow cytometry um, by inclusion of different sized counting uh, or different sized microparticles. For example, if you wanted to use um, one micron diameter beads, you could use that to compare uh, the size of cells within your sample to the bead sizes. Another question is, does addition of BSA or serum to flow buffer significantly change refractive index? I, I guess the answer to that question is how much of either of those is included in the, the buffer. Um, so that'll it sort of be an empirical experiment that you need to test um, in order to see if that significantly affects noise in the experiment. Um, 
Another question is that in the very uh, in the introduction of this webinar, um, I stated that I was going to say what those dots meant on one of the slides, um, but the user is still confused. Um, what I was meaning from that comment is that the dots on the slide are actual single cell events um, in the experiment. In other words, each dot in the plot in the right corner of the slide represents an individual particle in the example. Thank you for your time. It looks like we are um, out of time at this point. I will do my best to answer the additional questions um, offline. Thank you again.